<laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second and still exciting episode of a show called 10 to 1, where we make completely arbitrary lists about things film related. Um, yeah, I guess it's going to be one of those audio drama kind of nights because why not? I'm, uh, I'm one of your list makers, Josh, joined as always by. The lovely and talented Jen. Hey, I'm here, and uh, my audio is not suffering from the up and down syndrome, so at least there's that. Yeah, it was going fine until, you know, it's time to actually go live, and, and there it is. Murphy's Law is, is in full effect today, yes. Speaking of in full effect, why don't you tell the people what we are in for tonight? Okay, so yesterday I got completely caught off guard on my other podcast trying to explain what this podcast was about. So basically, this was the list that, that we came up with to aggregate. What are the top 10 most awesome chemistry duos that we can think of? Where are they uh, what movies were they in? You know, is there something like long lasting about it? Was it just a flash in the pan? I have uh, a bunch of movies that are very near and dear to me tonight. Um, they definitely shaped the way that I think about relationship, uh, specifically the sexual kind. So uh, I don't know about anybody else and, you know, how they view chemistry, but for me, it's always like, yeah, there's got to be some kind of spark and magic there. And uh, I didn't pick like Turner and Hooch or anything like that because I would have a very hard time seeing them as having sexual chemistry. That just doesn't quite work for me. So yeah, so there we go. You are on mute, my dear Josh. So why don't, we, why don't you go ahead and get the ball running and we can... Uh... Okay. All right. So this is 10 to 1. So we start at 10 and then we arrive at 1. And this one was tough for me because setting things in the proper order was not easy. Uh, there's a lot of chemistry with a lot of actors and actresses and actors and actors together and all kinds of different combinations. It was tough. This one was really tough. But I'm going to start with Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck in a movie called Double Indemnity. Uh, if you haven't seen Double mm -hmm. Indemnity, which probably a lot of people haven't, it's an older movie, uh, but Barbara Stanwyck and he, uh, Mr. McMurray, really light up the screen in a way that was almost controversial at the time. Um, even when I go back and look at it today, it is still red hot. Like there was seriously something between those two that just clicked. Um, the story itself is uh, a fairly, I guess it, I, I, I mean, it was 1944. It's a fairly straightforward uh, movie. It's not, you know, anything uh, super um like fantastical it's a crime film it's noir uh it was directed by billy wilder but it's stunning for the performance between these two actors the story is sort of like yeah okay that's what the story is it's the noir chemistry between the two of them that is just absolutely fabulous so that is my choice for number 10 what is your choice for number 10 josh well, and also, and also, wait, can I ask you, did you see it the same way as I did? Or did you decide that chemistry was a little bit more loose and fast? I think some of my definitions are going to be a little loosey goosey. Okay. Because it is something that's really hard to pin down without getting yeah. ultra specific. It, it's very subjective, too. I mean, everybody has kind of their own preferences for this, so. Some in, in some of um, some of my cases, it's um, it's down to pure raw, like sexual magnetism, and in other case, it's it's kind of like on the the opposite end of that spectrum of of that um, couple spec whatever you want to call it. You know, I guess the difference between love and lust. I'm I'm going to the extreme on on both sides. Hmm, okay, I can't wait to hear. Uh, number 10 is the exercise in the love 
portion of chemistry. And that belongs to 1991, Barry Sonnenfeld, The Adams Family. Oh, good one. When it comes to two characters being absolutely in love, does it get much more devoted than uh, Gomez and Morticia? Especially as portrayed by Raul Julian and uh, Angelica Houston? Truth. Total truth. Their, their chemistry is undeniable. And to say that they're... I mean, honestly... Uh, I'll explain it this way. Over the last few years, especially with, we'll say, Gen Zers, right? There, there's been this this thinking that people want to be like Harley Quinn and the Joker. Mm. Completely crazy thought, by the way, when it comes to that's what you want love to be. No, if there was ever a couple, that is the poster couple of everlasting love, it's Gomez and Morticia, and specifically these two from this film. So, interestingly, just so just to give this a, a bit of a side note spin, there's a great fan theory out there that says that Morticia actually gave Gomez a love potion far before they were ever married, and it's still in effect now, and it's why he has such uh undying love for her not that he doesn't still love her but it's but the over the topness it's a love potion so so you're <laughs> saying their love is juicing I, I, juicin? I, you know what I, and honestly i feel like that's something that morticia would totally do so but you're right those two i definitely think that those two actors have amazing on-screen chemistry and also just the delivery of their lines is like it's beyond perfect the way that they play off of each other. There's mm -hmm. just, there's, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely an on-screen thing to behold. So good choice. Thank you. Number nine. Um, my number nine is a movie which features uh, William Hurt and Kathleen Turner. Uh, interestingly enough, Kathleen Turner shows up twice in my list. Uh, mm -hmm. This movie is called Body Heat. And, I mean, the title kind of says it. Basically, there's this, it, it starts in the middle of a heat wave. And this lady, she talks William Hurt's character, who's a lawyer, into being her lover. And then they go on to plan the murder of her super rich husband. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, and, and there's so many twists and turns in this movie that the, in this one, the story alone kind of carries it. But then you have the relationship between uh, Kathleen Turner and William Hurt. And wow, it's electrifying on the screen. I mean, like I have shown this movie to people who had never seen it before because it is, it's a little bit older. It's 1981. Um, and they were blown away by it um, that, and amazed that they had never seen it before. One thing I will say about Body Heat, which is kind of interesting, is that at the time when Body Heat came out, it it felt like a lot of people were really clutching pearls about it uh, because it was so over the top with its uh, sexual. It, it wasn't just sexual promiscuity. It was the it it was honestly a bit more than that. It felt very real and people got very kind of incensed about that. So a couple of people on my list actually go through that. So that's my number nine body heat with William Hurt and Kathleen Turner from 1981. Well, I got to be honest so far. I'm batting zero on your end. <laughs> you haven't seen either of them, huh? I have not. I kind of wish I had uh, you know, some input for you, but I'm sorry. I'm a bad movie fan. <laughs> well, my number nine is surely one that is going to spark some feedback for various reasons. But if you feel like saying hello, at Skid Comic, you know where to find me. Uh -huh. 
but my number nine is let's see 2005 ang lee's brokeback mountain uh, really you think people won't like that Oh, I don't know if it, it'll be whether or not people would like it on the list. I honestly don't care. But you know how certain people are about certain subject matters. And uh, because of that, you know, whatever happens, happens. But I think uh, no matter how you slice it, Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal put in performances of a lifetime about two cowboys that fell in love on the range and the fact that it goes from like raw passion at some points uh, you know at some points all the way towards the end with the you know tenderly holding a jacket mm. any time that I, I I think about just two characters that that follow this trajectory. It, I mean, it, in my opinion, you'd be hard pressed to find the combination of uh, beauty with the cinematography, the talent with the acting, and the story all come together to to rake uh to make something um as good as as this relationship i mean sure and in, in a lot of respects it was very unhealthy but when it comes to again just the two characters their chemistry jake gyllenhaal keith ledger it was for me too undeniable there's that word again to be left off my list i i i think you're on to something with this particular choice uh in 2005 mtv gave this movie an award for best kiss <laughs> so uh clearly they were thinking about some of the content in here as being very outstanding when it came to chemistry. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. And, you know, I have to say um, hats off to both Heath Ledger and uh, Jake, because it's not easy to step out of your comfort zone in, in such a way and make it work and not only make it work, but make it work compellingly enough that we all feel like, there really is something going on between these two characters. It's but I, I've seen this done on several occasions and it feels a little bit wooden. It doesn't feel quite organic. Mm -hmm. Um, but these guys really did make it that way. So good, very good choice. Thank you. Um, okay, so my number eight is a movie with Jack Nicholson and Jessica Lang. And I, this is the one that I had mentioned before uh, the podcast that really kind of like, it, I saw this way too young and it confused the heck out of me, but I loved it. Oh my God. I watched it like three or four times before somebody said, Hey, maybe you shouldn't watch that anymore. Um, it also is a, a crime story uh, where the, the wife conspires with her lover to kill her husband. Um, I seem to have kind of an affinity for those stories. I don't know. It's called The Postman Always Rings Twice. Um, and if you haven't seen this movie, it is, it, it's, I don't want to say it's uncelebrated because a lot of people love this movie, but it's based off of a uh, another uh, movie that happened in the 19, I think it was 1946, and it was basically a noir. So it had, you know, something a little bit different going for it than The Postman Always Rings Twice with Jack Nicholson. Um, and this one was the kind of movie that is, it it's twisted. It's twisted and it feels uh, sticky wrong, if you will. There's mm -hmm. so much in it that is like, you know, I mean, 
they basically they go from just being sort of like attracted to each other he's basically a grifter they're attracted to each other and then they come up with a scheme to kill the husband it doesn't go off exactly as planned and then their happily ever after is seriously marred by the fact that they basically did this terrible thing um it's it's really good it's it's one of those like of human dynamic movies that just makes you kind of like your it makes your skin itch but it, the chemistry between Jack Nicholson and Jessica Lang is so good that it just jumps off the screen at you there's no way that you could possibly watch this movie and think oh they the the acting is not just absolutely good i mean I, at the time apparently i didn't know this before but at the time apparently there was a controversy that surrounded on set behavior and did they or didn't they um uh, they say no and but that didn't stop a bunch of people from saying hmm yeah, sure does sure seem that's like that's what happened and and also you know if i could say in this movie it's it wasn't like you know some current modern day movies where they show a lot i mean they showed enough but it wasn't it was it was very uh discreet in the way that compared to modern storytelling we have sex scenes set up and it but it was absolutely all right there so it really good really liked it a lot the postman always rings twice yeah and this one was another movie from wow 1981 seemed to be a pretty provocative year this is another movie from 1981 oh 81 i uh mm -hmm. and it, it they they title it a neo noir it's a neo noir erotic thriller so interesting awesome. so that's my number eight where are you at, i'm sorry yes that's my 10 9 8 where are you for your number eight well my number eight is going to be one that's uh and once again for some might be considered uh at a left field for the subject at hand but hear me out 1994 was a good year for james cameron why because he released one of the best spy thriller comedies ever. Was it Spy Kids? It was True Lies. <laughs> True Lies. Now, I know what you're thinking. That True Lies is a comedy with Arnold Schwarzenegger. How can how can you talk about that character or anything? Well, um, Lest we forget, he was starring opposite Jamie Lee Curtis. So not only am I talking about comedic chemistry, especially later on when secrets are revealed, but let's think it back. Let's think back to one very, very particular scene where Jamie Lee Curtis puts to be well, not wants to be, but it's kind of pseudo blackmailed into pulling off a, a mission. And of course, it was all set up by Arnold. And he wants her to make, you know, wants her to feel sexy and, and cool, and, you know, a spy. <laughs> so, what do we get? French speaking into a, a tape recorder. And Jamie Lee Curtis doing a sexy dance for her husband, who she doesn't know is her husband. But what makes this stand out to me, other than the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis has always looked amazing, is the, the idea that this couple that's been together for so long and he managed to keep his secrets and about what he did and, and, and things like that. They still need to find some way to spice it up. It, 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 it's the film version of the Pina Colada song. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
but when I was uh, a, a young lad of 12 and watching this, this relationship play out on the screen, it struck a chord with me. Again, it all, it all comes down to two people that love each other very much and are willing to do virtually anything to make sure the other is happy. And that's the sexiest thing I can think of. Nice. So that was my number eight. Okay. My, uh, I just realized I have a serious pattern going here until basically my next movie. Uh, my number seven is Sharon Stone and Michael Douglas in Basic Instinct. And Basic Instinct released in 1992, is another neo-noir erotic thriller. I, I did, actually didn't even think about that, but they are, everything's falling into a pattern here. Um, and, you know, I got to say that Basic Instinct did not do a lot for me in terms of the plot. Um, I did, I, I give it, you know, full props for being what it is. It's not a bad movie. Um, but it's the chemistry between the two of them that make it work. It's absolutely not the story of the movie. Um, and, you know, the end is a little bit, I don't know. Would you consider that trite? Would you consider the end of Basic Instinct to be trite? Because I kind of think it sort of was. I mean... It felt a little bit, I don't know, too sewn up for its own good. But again, the on-screen chemistry between the two. I mean, there's a couple of, of love scenes in that movie that just are a bit over the top. And also, uh, shout out to Sharon Stone. Because although the movie hypersexualizes her, I don't feel even one time that she lost any of the credibility that she sort of pulled together to do both that role and all the subsequent roles afterwards. I mean, she is a force of nature and an absolutely brilliant, brilliant person, including being an amazing director uh, and filmmaker of her own, in, in, in her own right, I should say. Um, she's really, really awesome. But this is sort of like one of those peeks into who... Uh, are who characters are with actors behind them that really feels like wow you know what you put a thousand percent into this role and i mean you know michael douglas was good too but it was sharon stone that i think really carried it so that's mine what is yours huh well my my uh my next one I was I was waiting for uh, see um, for those of you that aren't looking at my screen. I am constantly having to pull down the microphone level. <coughs> Gets to be a bit distracting. You probably hear that. Yep, there it goes. <laughs> but I will. It's kind of like you just here. open the refrigerator. So it's fine. You're just making us hungry. <laughs> Um, my number six is, uh, well, to be quite frank, it's just going to be on the horny side of things. <laughs> That's a good choice. Good choice. I won't speak much to the quality of the movie, but as far as what's on it, what's in it, 1995... Uh, directed by Greg Araki, The Doom Generation. I don't think I've seen that. It is crazy. It's about these... Uh, it, ha it has Rose McGowan, um, James Duvall, and Jonathan Shike. I guess I don't know. Um, but essentially, this chick and her boyfriend, they're 
doing their thing. And they pick up this uh, this drifter. And after they pick up the drifter, crazy things start happening. Like uh, storekeepers are getting body parts blown off and everywhere they go the the subtotal equals 666 oh that's not disturbing yeah you know mid 90s you know we're edgy right but the thing is the, the boyfriend kind of gets uh, and I'm trying to it's been a while since I've seen this um the boyfriend gets a little antsy because the drifter is kind of seems like he's making eyes at a girl, you know. Yeah, it turns out that's the case. They sleep together. But then things happen, and next thing you know, everybody's sleeping together. Whoa. So when it comes to just straight up like lust driven story um two things came to my mind this was one of them and uh that's why they, it's on the list because i'm trying to come at you know come at it from different angles <clears throat> okay I, I i first of all that's the first movie that has been on, I think, most of your lists that I haven't seen. So <laughs> that's good. I'm super excited about that. Uh, secondly, it sounds like a really interesting premise. I like it. Um, my next movie <clears throat> is... <clears throat> my next movie is, I would not say a good movie. It's a beloved movie, but I don't know if it's a good movie. I mean, if I'm thinking about it it's critically, n no. <laughs> Although that would be, you know what? There is seriously some chemistry going on in that movie. Um, I, it's beloved by, it, like it has become almost, uh, I don't want to call it a cult classic, but it's become, it has that level of sort of adoration around it. And honestly, this movie launched a thousand tropes, literally a thousand mm. tropes. Uh, it is Antonio Banderas and Catherine Zeta-Jones in Zorro, The Mask of Zorro. Ah, so 19, 1988, I mean, the story is kind of, uh, wow. It's a, it's, it's thin. It is an it's extremely a, it's a thin Zorro story. story, you know? Yes. It, it's, it, it's, you know, your average, I shouldn't say your average, but it is the story of revenge. It's a, you know, they can be kind of a dime a dozen. This one just happens to fit into the niche of, hey, here's Zorro. But what makes this movie really stand out is honestly the relationship between Antonio Banderas and Catherine Zeta-Jones characters. Zorro has a, a kind of cavalier very rough sort of uh but suave uh demeanor and Catherine zader jones is just amazing in this role i mean she's not just strong she's defiant in so many ways and able to hold her own and so it makes the relationship between the two of them not one where you know it's his conquest but more their sort of uh, ability to conquer things together, which is absolutely amazing. I really loved that. And I obviously, I really feel like that is one of the best representations that you can get out of a movie like Zorro. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, we had to go back and watch The Mask of Zorro after uh, my kids had watched Shrek to explain where the characters came from and especially Puss in Boots because I mean it's just almost carbon copy of the character that he played as Zorro so super good really liked it uh, you know for just that piece which is that relationship piece so that's my number six your number six well my number six is well we 
we're, we're just going to say it falls with the same lines as the previous one. And I put them back to back, you know, kind of get them out of the way there. And I'm going with the wild things. Okay, now that one I've seen. And I think we all know why. Not not why you watched it, but why it's on the list. <laughs> it does kind of speak for itself. It does. It does. It's a mystery wrapped in a thriller wrapped in a threesome. I thought that was pretty clever, if you ask me. I think so, too. It's, it's also... Uh, it's also... If I'm not mistaken, it wasn't that written by uh, Dave Eggers. I think so. Yeah, I think it was. And and man, he's a good writer. He's a really good writer. And that I thought was uh, worth putting on the list because when it comes to I'll be honest. The, the, the thing that, that Wild Things took out of the running, strangely enough, also has memories centered around the pool. Hmm. Wild Things kicked out Fast Times at Richmond High. Wow. I figured only one pool per list. Seems like a good rule to go by. <laughs> I mean, we could actually make that a whole 10 to 1 list, right? Oh, it will be eventually. <laughs> pool scenes is definitely, that's a that's a big, big, big topic. For Back sure. to school. <clears throat> Just Poltergeist. Saying. Yeah. I mean, there's so many. There's so many. Yeah. Um, okay. My number five. My number five is... Based on two things. One, the on-screen chemistry, because that had to be first and foremost. But secondly, the source material chemistry, which I just so happen to absolutely adore. Adore enough to uh, dress up in cosplay and go pretend to be one of these people for weekends at a time. It is Kiera Knightley and Matthew McFadden in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, I love Jane Austen, but I've seen many adaptations of Pride and Prejudice, and honestly, sometimes there is zero chemistry between anybody. It just feels like, again, it goes back to the wooden feeling of you're acting this out and it's stiff. And I think, you know, to everybody's credit that tries this, the material is stiff. This is a hard piece of material to bring to life but being stoic and creating chemistry that's a skill that's a gift that is an actor's really solid skill to have in their basket and somehow the two of them really manage this um it, it's and i can't even tell you exactly like where it specifically starts, it just sort of falls into place. Um, and I'm not a huge Kira Knightley fan. I mean, I she's an amazingly talented actress, but like I don't really find a lot of the stuff that she does to be like filled with a lot of chemistry for most things. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the reason that I like her in movies is because she's such a strong character actor. I believe she is the characters that she says she is. Um, and Matthew McFadden is, he's beautiful. I mean, he's a gorgeous looking guy, but same thing, right? I don't really think about him as like my go-to person for, oh yeah, you know, there's definitely going to be some steam on the screen when he's there. I don't see that very often, but get the two of them together in this role and, it really works. It really works. So that's my number five. And I got to say, I actually went back and watched this movie just so that I could be sure that, yes, this was the right pick. And it totally was. 2005, right? 2005, yes. All righty. And uh, once again, still uh, swinging and missing for me. 
Really? You never saw the 2005 Pride and Prejudice? I have not seen any of the movies you've mentioned. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Okay, well, I mean, uh, you know, the age gap difference between us might matter a little. So A little. But I, I'm pretty sure there's... Um, my, my number five is... Not something you've seen. Hmm, okay. Even though I've told you to watch it. I'm sorry, oh. that sounds really mean. I ordered you to watch it. No, uh, no, that's no better. Uh, um, I'm not really good at taking commands anyway, so. Which is fair. I'm, I'm in no position to give them. But. I mean, if you want to throw me a hundred bucks, I'm sure. Right here for you. But my number five is not about steamy romance. It's not even about true love. No, we're taking it back a little bit. And we're talking about heartstrings here. Is it E.T.? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're not taking it that far back. We're taking it back. <laughs> I take character wise, we're taking it back to uh, 2018's uh, Relish, directed by Justin Ward. 2018 Relish. Okay, yeah, no, this is the one that I didn't see. That is correct. You're right. But there were... There were... <clears throat> there, there, you, you, well, first of all, it's about a group of... Um, teenagers that are not quite locked up in an asylum or anything like that. They're not committed, but they're having some issues. And this is kind of like the step before that, kind of a preventive place for them to stay for whatever reason they were deemed by their parents, by the state, whatever, to, to be kind of kept an eye on for a while. And they bust out and they go to, well, they want to go to uh, a festival. It's a big concert. Well, two characters in particular, uh, played by Hannah Hayes and Tyler, uh, I want to say Daikiara. I've never heard the name said out loud. But Hannah is. Uh, she plays like a social media influencer type. And Tyler's like the uh, kind of like cool. The cool guy. I, I guess that's the way to put it. And throughout their trip, it seems like this crush, you know, it's kind of, it's growing, you know, they're getting to know each other, except it feels like the, I don't know, seeing them together on screen, playing off of each other, it works so well, especially for, you know, what they're trying to to go for. I'm sorry. This the microphone but, is screaming into my ear and it, <laughs> needless to say, uh you relish this movie. It I do. It, it is one that I watch multiple times a year and enjoy it very much uh for a lot of very different reasons. I love her holographic dress. That's actually one of my when I went to go look at the at the screenshots, that holographic dress that she's wearing is super cool. So and probably something that I could have seen myself wearing at that time. So yeah. Maybe uh maybe I will definitely watch it. You mean you I will think definitely, I'm, definitely watch it, yes. I, I I think I might actually even have a dress like that still in my closet. <laughs> okay. My number four <clears throat> is uh at the time. Uh, one of the 
weirdest combinations that I ever thought that I would go, oh, you know who would make a good couple? These guys. And uh, turns out on screen, um, maybe the chemistry was uh, a little bit more than just, hey, we're actors acting because they ended up getting married, which is sort of crazy, and broke up uh, Americans rela- America's relationship with, you know, these two darlings that they loved. I don't uh, know what it is, and it was it was on my list. Really? And I took it off. Oh. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Smith with uh, mm-hmm. Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie is one of my go-to movies whenever I am feeling uh, kind of like either frustrated or upset or whatever, because... Man, there is something just so channelingly good in that. It 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 brings together everything from hey, I love you to hey, I hate you to I'm totally indifferent to why can't you see me to uh, everything. It's kind of like we are watching in the entire evolution of a relationship go from start to finish and then like a phoenix reborn. It it's it, 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 it's so unique in the in the chemistry part because there's not very many people that can play I love you I hate you so well without it feeling kind of corny but mm-hmm. these guys really do make it feel like I love you I hate you it's not like it doesn't feel corny it feels like even the silly lines feel like they are well executed and just biting 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 and i have to say that i really do love that and the levels of sarcasm that they threw in there it makes the whole movie enjoyable and again you can really see that brad pitt and angelina jolie had true on-screen chemistry there was something between the two of them that just exploded which which was not just the characters themselves it was definitely something like almost palpable you know it's something about the way they look at each other too but i really loved this movie i absolutely adore angelina jolie she's amazing and brad pitt i had a crush on forever and a day i mean still do but um he's sort of been replaced by chris hemsworth sorry buddy um uh but I, I, at the time, I was so enamored with Brad Pitt that I would have watched him spread jelly on toast and been super happy. So this was great. I'm glad you said on toast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's plenty other places, too. But uh, th- uh, as boring as you could be, that is what that kind of comes down to. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith was amazing, and I highly recommend it. Fun so fact. It would have been my number four as well. Ooh. Tricky, tricky. So, Which what did you been, replace it with? It would it, it would have been two weeks in a row where we got the same number four. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Wow, we don't plan this. I swear, we don't even talk about it. I don't even think about it until ten minutes before air. Oh well, okay. That's a little. That's a. We'll discuss that later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what did you replace it with then? What is your number four? Well, if I can get this uh, stupid weather bug to stop being on my screen i'll just move that window <laughs> over why because it's not a what go media production without a lot of things screwing up you know what you're not the only one that can uh dig through the archives you know oh oh you're not the only one that can pull a classic movie God, no, but Damn, no but i so am much. But but I, I am one of the few people who will actually plan a movie night with just TCM movies. I do not know many people that will sit through an entire evening of Turner Classic movies. So, well, that's where you would be wrong. <laughs> All right, lay it on us. What do you got? Speaking of TCM, I'm pretty sure that's where I watched this. It's 1960s. Yeah, the year 1960. Bells are ringing. Ooh. Judy Holiday and Dean Martin. Nice. The couple that, again, you know, that maybe there's a theme of secrets going on too in, in, in my list. But when it, when it comes down to it, 
she knows his secrets because she takes his messages and they start having this chat, you know, and then you got this one-sided relationship going on where she's like, yeah. Oh, and let's face it, the cops are pressing her because they think she's a prostitute. You know how it is. Uh -huh. And not only does she have to kind of keep things separate from the job. So, you know, uh, if I remember right, he calls her mother because she, that's the persona that she she has on the phone. But in person, you know, she's, of course, mostly herself. And the fact that they're, they start building this, this relationship and, and she knows all this stuff. And he's like, how does she know all this? We, we must be, we, you know, it must be right. And uh, one of my, one of my favorite things to see in, in movies is the fall. Yeah. I, I, Call me whatever. I'm not a I'm not a big believer in the, you know, you look across the room and so as I was saying, bells are ringing is my is my number four, and this is absolutely the movie that made me a Ju Judy Holiday fan. One one hundred percent. This is the movie. Because honestly, it's going to sound awkward, but Judy Holiday is an adult. You, you look at some of the other movies from around this period in time, and a lot of the romantic female leads have this this certain air about them right that like the Doris days where they uh, almost seem like they play younger well so let's be very clear about what's happening here not that we're moving away from chemistry but honestly this is adult male Hollywood infantilizing women to fit specific stereotypes and that's what we got that that was the 60s and you're right in this movie she doesn't play that kind of narrow role mm -mm. yes I no agree. naivete there she is yep she's on it and that is honestly a very uh i think attractive attribute especially when it's something that's you know, at the time of seldom seen. Can can I make a quick observation about this movie? Absolutely. First of all, first of all, it's an amazing musical. Absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. It's it's gorgeous, and if you ever get to see it on on stage, it, it it's really well done. Uh, it's always a good good time. Secondly, um, her character is kind of like what the internet was before the internet was. Um, as an answering service, she didn't just like take messages. She gave information and it's, it's crazy. It's like she was able to pull together so much in this little tiny spot. And then you see like the party lines where, you know, it's basically like having kind of a, 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 a zoom call, a conference call on rotary phones. I, it, it was really cool. It, it's actually a neat piece of, hey, look how far we've come in technology and what technology has sort of done to how we behave with each other in even romantic situations. It's kind of neat. I, I have to say that I think that that was a good choice, Josh. And that's why I picked it, because it is a great choice. Up. Very good job. Number three um, for you. All right. Number three for me is The Princess Bride. Uh, I probably don't need to go into any long detail about what The Princess Bride is all about, but I will say that I cannot think about on screen chemistry and not think about. 
Carrie Ellis and Robin Wright. I absolutely feel like they don't just work together. They were the quintessential couple in my fairy tale head forever in a day. And if we move out from there, um, the relationships, which sort of like works into the best friend thing that we did on our last podcast, the mm -hmm. relationships between everybody in this movie are so wholesome and honest um at least all of the good guys <laughs> um there is something so amazing even even with uh Vicini, who is just he just is who he is I, everything in this movie feels like there is a purpose for each piece of the relationship as it kind of passes through the story. And I totally love that. It's so unique and so kind of special uh, of a story. But the relationship that the two of them have together is really, it, it just, it holds a really special place in my heart. I can't even remember a time when I didn't think about the Princess Bride as being sort of the quintessential, if you could grow up and have a fairy tale ending, what would it be? Oh yeah, that's what it would be. So that is my number three, The Princess Bride. As you wish. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Uh, just to, to toss in my two cents, I had a feeling you would put it on there, and that's one of the reasons I didn't. Mm. Because if you didn't put it on there, that would be inconceivable. <laughs> And uh, let's not forget, uh, yeah, everyone talks about, you know, Inigo Montoya and Buttercup. And this, this. No, let's give some props to the seventh wonder of the world, Andre the Giant. Or no, the eighth wonder of the world, Andre the Giant. Come on. Yeah, indeed. So, yes, props for that choice. Absolutely. That, that's one of those movies that like, if you put me on a desert island and you asked me to just like, you know, bring a couple movies, that would be one of them. I could watch it ad infinitum. There's only one movie that my middle child likes more than that, or at least um, they, if they haven't updated their favorite movies list, there's only one movie ahead of that one. And that, of course, is uh, The Goonies. Ooh. I raised my kids right. Yeah. <laughs> Good choice. Good choice, kid. But uh, speaking of kid, let, let me uh, tell you a really quick little story about growing up. I've, I've heard you've done it before. I did, sort of. I mean, I've also regressed, but yeah. In 1990, a movie came out directed by Jerry Zucker that my father was like, you know what? Let me take my eight-year-old to see this flick. And it ruined my life. Oh. And I mean that in the most deeply sad psychological way you can imagine. And that movie was Ghost. Oh. So I'm eight years old and being confronted with this film about death not cool and it led to a lifelong I, not obsession but definitely death was always on the back of my mind right oh my gosh. so yeah watching that at an early age put thoughts into my head that I did not want to have not even the cool you know, sexy thoughts that uh, a lot of other people had, but like I didn't take up pottery <laughs> for good reasons. I could see why. I just kept thinking about death. But as I got older and watched it, and those thoughts kind of drifted more towards the back of my mind, I could start to appreciate the the chemistry that was there between Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. Neither 
and and I'm gonna even put Dirty Dancing on this doesn't match up to these two. Uh, as far as Patrick Swayze goes, there is just something about the sensuality not not a, a ghost but uh a love that crosses even beyond death that echoes and that it resonates through through i think anybody with feeling that watches it absolutely and and I can't listen to Unchained Melody without thinking of that one very specific scene ever again. I, I feel like for a lot of us, that is so totally true. Yeah. Yeah. That's another list that we should come up with at some point. You know, the iconic songs that will be forever tied to the movies that they're in. Uh, yeah. You can't listen to the song without seeing the movie in front of you. Mm-hmm. Oh, Yeah. I've got a couple of those. Also, you know, when you said 1990, I swear to God, my brain went to, oh, that was only 10 years ago. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is so funny, but it really is pretty funny. I, um, I, I get that way sometimes, too. I, 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 I won't even go into how old that makes me feel. I'm just going to skip over that like a, you know, a little bit of a record and go, yep, yeah, nope, not doing that. Okay. <clears throat> my number two, since we are at the number two spot. Number two. Number two is, I, and I don't know how even to explain why this had such a huge impact on me. It should not have. Uh, it should have been exactly the opposite. Clark Gable, Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind. Um, I... D Man, you know what? Other than the Princess Bride, which is truly wholesome and beautiful, um, I, most of my choices are basically people that move into these love-hate relationships. I love you. I hate you. Uh, the on-screen chemistry is very much based on like a uh, flash in the pan of something that happens. I just realized that other than my number one choice, I am, no, no, not even my number one choice. Wow. I, I really, my entire list is all about uh, love and hate. So uh, interesting, very interesting, but Gone with the Wind, uh, another iconic movie, which I don't even feel like anybody needs to have explained to them. It truly at the time now, I mean, it's been, redone it's been remastered the soundtrack has been redone um there's all kinds of great things that happened with this movie uh behind the scenes it's a really interesting story but on screen clark gable and vivian lee really hit something they there was some kind of mutual chord that they struck with each other which allowed them to play off of both each other's sort of like charms and then also this really dark side which again kind of like mr and mrs smith you know that's hard that's not easy to kind of pull off without it feeling hokey or you know corny not really feeling real or feeling like it's a caricature of itself i mean the iconic line you know uh that clark gable gives during gone with the wind is not lost on anyone that hears it and it's even if you say it in a way that sounds corny when it's delivered on the screen it doesn't sound corny at all right um it absolutely feels like in the moment that is exactly what he would say um and i, I kind of love uh the 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 the, the, the visceralness between them. I truly, truly, truly love it. Um, <laughs> I, I can't say that like I use this line often, but when I do use it, it really does have impact for me. So if you're around me and I say, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, uh, you know, you have basically like hit the last, you've taken the last straw. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, I, I really, really, really love this movie. So, so there is something definitely about Clark Gable that is pretty amazing. Uh, his performance is truly stellar. But Vivian Lee also is like, man, so much passion from this woman. Just absolutely amazing on screen. So I really love this. This was 1939. But like I said, it's been remastered and recolorized as well. And it really looks amazing. So... They did a good job with it. One day I'll watch it. Really good. Oh god, it's a really good movie. It's a really good movie. It's 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 not without its problems. It's very problematic in a lot of different ways, right? There's a lot of uh content which is really just inexcusable anymore. But it but it there's a niche that this movie fits into and you can't deny the chemistry of it, that's for sure. But uh, uh... A good, good number two. Good number two. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. And what is your number two? My number two is uh, another off the wall pick, and again, it's going to be one that makes maybe people raise an eyebrow or two because 2013, directed by Spike Jones. It's her. Oh, good choice. That's a really interesting one. I don't know if it's just the tone of Scarlett Johansson's voice coupled with uh, Joaquin Phoenix's... I, I, I don't even know how to describe his character other than he's just an awkward guy, right? But the way they talk to each other, just the pretty much having its audio, ha having this relationship build up, the talking, the so how was your day, you know, and and like I said before, the fall, more more so on on his side, but even through straight voiceover Scarlett Johansson able to to portray that fall as an AI right and these two characters inexplicably have this magic about them that makes it completely believable yeah, there's definitely the falling in love spark that they have between them. And then there is the heart wrenching, which I think actually adds to the chemistry that they have. Uh, eventual understanding that he is, I mean, I hate to say that he's outclassed, but like he's, he doesn't belong in that world. And having to come to that realization is just absolutely wrecking. I, I I loved this movie. For also, I have to say that this movie has one of the best philosophical, foundational ideas about what it is to be. First of all, what it is to fall in love, and secondly, mm -hmm. how we are going to come to understand our relationships with AI. Can we? You know, wh what is it about the human condition that? that allows us to fall in love is it just with another human or is it something else and yeah it's a really interesting philosophical question and that's why it's my number two i really like that movie really good choice all right drum roll please we are at number one so uh recently i watched this movie called city of gold and i loved it because of course you know there was a cameo of brad pitt and it was <laughs> super fun i really liked it it was you know one of those kind of uh offbeat quirky uh movies which i have to say somebody told me that whenever they saw um the, the lead character who is a romance writer um mm -hmm. that they basically couldn't see it without thinking about me they put me in that position so uh at first i was kind of like uh taken aback and then i was like mm, hey you know this is kind of cool 
I actually kind of like this. Um, but the, the whole movie is is really centered, or I shouldn't say centered, it's kind of like a reboot almost of Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner, there her name is again, in a movie called Romancing the Stone, ah. which was from mm. 1984. And I saw uh, this, I saw Romancing the Stone, I don't know, I guess I, I can't, I was young when I saw it. Uh, but it was another one of those movies that the on-screen chemistry between the two of them made the whole movie because the whole movie is ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's like Indiana Jones camp style with a romance novelist. It's, it's just, it's so silly, Uh, but it's so much fun because you are immediately drawn in by the relationship that Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas share together. Um, And I have to say it is just such an enjoyable, entertaining movie and the the two of them make everything in the movie worth it um it's i I will say that as i was watching um because i went back and watched it again and as i was watching like what the build-up is it is the ability of the two of them to hold each other at bay for so long while clearly experiencing that kind of tension that is I really 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 like you and I really don't know how to say it or I really think that this is going to be a bad idea I cannot do it cannot do it and and it's that that you know kind of holding each other apart because they do it themselves and then the inevitability of being together that makes the movie totally work so that's my number one choice. Uh, if you haven't seen Romancing the Stone, you should definitely take it for a quick spin. It is so, it's such an enjoyable hour and 20 minutes. It goes by so fast. Um, and it's just absolutely fun. So that's fine. That's I will one. say that I have seen it, but I saw it. A very, 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 very long time ago. So it might be one uh, that I need hit, need to hit refresh on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That and Jewel of the Nile. Um, when you when you compare it to uh, the Lost City, um, the thing that you walk away with the most is the relationship between. Because they they change up the roles, right? Where all of a sudden the romance novelist is basically like the the more no, I don't want to say she's more adventurous because she's not, uh, but she's like the more together person of the duo, and um, and the the dynamic gets completely switched around. So watching the Lost City is like watching Romancing the Stone flipped on its head, and it worked so well that it really it, it made me. It made me think that, yeah, this is why this particular kind of movie really, really works, because that's it. And Sandra Bullock has not lost any of her spark. Any. I I mean, she is just absolutely on it. Um, Channing Tatum was really great, too. But the two of them together had exactly what Romancing the Stone had but I think it was a little bit less played uh, in *Romancing the Stone*. It's definitely much more very hyper. Uh, it's uh, it's hyper romanticized. It's more like a romance novel. I guess that's the best way to say it. So, what is your number one movie, Josh? I can't wait to hear it. Uh, you're you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> you know, I couldn't finish this list without uh, without turning it completely on its head. And uh, I will say that my number one checks all the boxes. Okay. You want love? It's got love. You want pure, unadulterated lust? It's got that too. You want special celebrations on National Women's Day? Yep. I'm talking of, of course, 2016, directed by Tim Miller, 
Deadpool. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Can talk about, I mean, Wade Wilson and, 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 and so much in love that he would literally do anything for her and she would let her do anything to him. So I don't know how you get more chemistry than that. Two people fall in love. They are so compatible. It's unreal. And, and I don't mean just like the, the lovey-dovey, oh, I love you. Mm, I'm going to miss you. Blah. Right? I'm talking these two grown-ass adult people know what they want, and they want each other. Not, <laughs> not just for the bedroom, but also they just love to do stupid things together, too. Okay, so let me stop you right now, because we could almost throw Venom into this mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Deadpool is my number one. Um, I would love to expand upon that even more, but i got another show starting in five minutes. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. Deadpool, number awesome. one. Very good choice. Very good choice. Perfect choice. Okay, so just to recap real quick, we've got Double Indemnity, Body Heat. We've got Postman Always Rings Twice. We've got Basic Instinct. We've got The Mask of Zorro. We've got Pride and Prejudice. We've got Mr. and Mrs. Smith, The Princess Bride, Gone with the Wind, and Romancing the Stone. Run down your list one time. And on my end, we have The Addams Family, Brokeback Mountain, True Lies, The Doom Generation, Wild Things, Relish, Bells Are Ringing, Ghost Her, <laughs> Ghost Her, <laughs> and uh, Ghost Her Deadpool. There we go. Deadpool uh, rounding out the top 10 and what is our podcast about next week on 10 to 1 10 to 1 next week it's all about the music that's right mm. i know i know they're like but you guys talk about movies ah but did you know movies have music and you know what that's not arbitrary enough let's let's focus this laser a little bit more we're talking about our favorite bands Hold on, scratch that. Rewind, restart. Our favorite fictional bands. Ooh. And All the right. music that they uh, that they deliver to us. Though, so, so if there's a group that was created specifically for a movie, right? That actually produced music for said movie then you're in. Oh, this is going to be an interesting one. I think so, too. That's 20 movies that we have to come up with that specifically fit this genre. So that'll be fun. I think so, too. All right. Well, uh, you can catch me over at moviesandmeals.com, and I will see you next week at 10 to 1. And Josh? Yeah. And well... And um, as always, you can go to watchcomedia.com, get all the great links to all the cool stuff. And uh, Jen may not be like talking about it, but you should also watch TV dinners every Thursday night at 8 30. <laughs> sure, you can plug it. No problem. Every, every Thursday night, 8 30. <laughs> watch it. It's all about TV. Last night's episode was about, about the boys. So if you're into the boys, go back and check that out. Love to have your comments. Uh, as, uh, in about three minutes, the Wadcast starts right here. So uh, in four minutes, why don't you go ahead and click that old refresh or, you know, find a new link. Whatever floats your boat, kids. But uh, that's going to do it for us on 10 to 1 this week. Jen, you put together an amazing list. Thank you. And so did you, Josh. I really okay. actually liked everything on the list. So we'll see you all back here next week. And for now, bye-bye. <laughs>